The uh, next talk is going to be given by Professor Timothy Roscoe. Um, he's commonly and fondly referred to as Moti. I think he prefers that, so I'm just going to call him Moti. Uh, Moti graduated from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he worked on an operating system called Nemesis. I encourage you all to go and read, read about it. I think I've known Moti since he was a graduate student. Um, after Cambridge, he worked in startups, he worked at Sprint, he worked at the Intel Research Lab. Um, I lost track of that after Intel, but he now teaches at the ETH in, uh, in Zurich, um, where he does, his group does operating systems research, hardware research, and so on and so forth. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Chandu. Yes, I think, I think I was a grad student. Um, it was yes, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, so thanks very much for, for inviting me. Um, this talk is going to be very different from Mutian's talk. Uh, so it's going to be, um, I need to preface it with a bunch of disclaimers. First thing is that um, unlike his talk, I'm not going to show you much in the way of nice numeric results or indeed results. Um, this is very much work in progress. And at the moment, um, we're fairly confident that it's going to work, but it doesn't necessarily work yet. Okay, and you'll, you'll see that as we go through it. Second thing is, um, that I am not a machine learning or an AI person. Uh, I pointed this out to, to John Du, and he you know, did not rescind my invitation as a result of this. Uh, but I am very much sort of systems, system software person, as John Du says, operating systems and networking. So this is very much from that sort of perspective. Someone who doesn't necessarily work much in machine learning has some friends who do. Um, but at the same time, machine learning is one of the key sort of drivers behind yeah, it sort of motivates the kind of work I'm going to talk about here. Um, the third thing I'm going to do is, is say that, you know, as Chandu says, I spent about almost exactly half of my career post-graduation in industry, but I'm going to um, talk about this work very much from the perspective of an academic, okay, which is what I, I now am. Um, but this is a talk specifically about what it means to be an academic doing systems research um, right now, right? This is a very interesting time to be doing systems research um, because a whole load of things are changing. Right? Uh, in particular, there's some very interesting changes with workloads. Machine learning, partly enabled, as, as, as people have said, by these, you know, the advent of very high performance um, computing has itself then factored back and changed how people are thinking about the computing platforms that they build, right? And that, um, you know, there are other drivers for that as well. You know, mobile phones and things have really internally now look very, very different to the way that a PC used to look, for instance, uh, in terms of the number of processes, the kinds of processes, how they're connected up inside uh, the phone or in some cases inside the SOC, inside the phone. So it's a very interesting time to be doing systems op operating systems research. The workloads are changing. The hardware is changing. The question is, what do you do if you like me, or an academic doing research into system software, okay? And in particular, the advent of a lot of custom software, very diverse software, and also reconfigurable logic, okay? At one level, workloads like large-scale machine learning, big data workloads, things like that is changing. And the question is, what do we do, right? Um, and I'm gonna talk about what it means for us to do that, and I'm gonna talk about a computer that we're building in order to do research, okay? And this seems like a strange sort of thing to do. I mean, it's a great excuse to build a computer, but I'm going to talk about why we're actually deciding to build a computer for ourselves, what that means. Given all this fancy hardware out there, why are we then building another piece of hardware? Okay. That's really what this talk is about. So I'm going to start with an observation about what is happening in the hardware uh, landscape. Okay. Um, almost all the interesting systems out there increase, at, at scale are increasingly using custom hardware. Right? They're using chips that have been designed specifically for particular workloads, or they're using reconfigurable logic in the form of FPGAs, or both. Okay? There was a time, there was a long period of time, um, which I can remember the start of, and I can just about remember the end of. Right? When Chandu and I were young and enthusiastic about things, Computers were hugely diverse, right? There were many, many different kinds of computers and operating systems out there. Um, many people built their own computers. Um, but the hardware architecture was quite diverse. And so the field of system software research was sort of navigating this quite diverse hardware space, okay? 
Then a few things happened. The PC came along. The PC typically run you know, a fairly standard operating system. If you were out in the commercial world, this was uh, Windows. If you were in the um, academic space or the hobbyist space, this was Linux. And suddenly, everything became remarkably standardized. Okay? In, even inside phones, things looked a little bit like PCs, but with ARM processors. Almost all the commodity desktops, laptops, sort of appliances were PCs. All sort of IoT, early IoT devices were little PCs, basically. And then in the data center, there were just clusters of PCs. So it was this extraordinary standardization, horizontalization of the market. Okay? And just recently, that has all changed again. Right? It's changed in the phone space, which I'm not going to talk about, or the edge space, because custom hardware is needed to keep the power down. Um, or law ending, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And in the data center space, which is probably where I'll be talking about most, um, it's changed as well. We have a lot of custom hardware, ASICs, FPGAs, on-chip accelerators, beyond GPUs. GPUs, I think, may be one of the first symptoms of this. But now you've got things like you know, Google's cloud TPU, widespread deployment of FPGAs in the cloud data centers of places like um, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, uh, Amazon F1, you can go onto Amazon Web Services and you can rent a machine with some big, big FPGAs in it, download your bitstream onto those FPGAs, and you know, do your blockchain hashing or whatever it is you want to do um, on Amazon's cloud and pay them for it in accordance for it. A lot of people are building custom hardware, um, some of which makes it to market, some of which is canceled, some of which pivots into something else, but projects like uh, the machine from HP, Oracle's rapid system, the Spark M7 has some very interesting database acceleration cores for big data. Um, Microsoft, of course, uh, one of the pioneers in this area, are deploying FPGAs in data centers in the form of a project that was originally called Catapult. Um, now Azure Smart NIC is one of the applications for that particular piece of hardware, and so on and so on and so on. Okay? So this is interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on um, in the way of you know, custom hardware right? that doesn't look like a PC. However, that means that if you're at a university and you're doing system software research, whether it's databases or operating systems or frameworks for machine learning or something else, you have a problem, which is what you have access to is essentially what you can buy, which is sort of in this box here. The available feasible hardware design space for systems for artificial intelligence or machine learning or almost any other application is vast. Okay? And what you're getting is people are building, you know, cloud TPUs or something else, these little point solutions, which are optimized for particular kinds of workloads, whether it's sort of deep learning or something like that, are out here. They're doing this for a very good reason. These things really work well. Okay? Um, but if you're a researcher and you want to explore this space, you're stuck in this box. And this box is clearly not where the interesting action is. And so at a university, what can you do about this problem? What can you do to sort of explore more of this space that perhaps companies are not exploring because they have particular commercial imperatives, they have particular time frames and horizons beyond which it is not easy to justify business-wise to look. If you're a university, you know, perhaps we should be taking a broader view, a longer-term view. That's why, they, that's why the, uh, the companies tend to fund us. But we don't have any access to the hardware. Okay. So what do we do? Okay. And, and I'm very lucky to be at, at, at ETH in Zurich. It's a great place. Um, one of the great things about it is that uh, companies like to talk to us a lot, and we like dealing with companies. And so the big challenge, the first big challenge that you have as a systems researcher um, trying to, to do some work in this area is, first of all, you need to get hold of some hardware, okay? Get, try and understand what some of this hardware actually looks like. So this is where you hit the first problem, simply getting hold of some of the hardware. Uh, this is the version one of the cloud TPU, which is sort of purely did inference. Uh, inside Google. Um, it's very unlikely that any of us will ever get our hands on one of these unless we happen to work at Google. Okay? Right? And there's a good reason for that. Right? This is not Google being mean. They're doing this for very, very sensible reasons. Right? Typically, these pieces of hardware are developed, particularly data center pieces of hardware, are developed by something as a service companies for their own internal use. Right? There is very little value to them in enlarging the ecosystem of users of this hardware directly, particularly when that hardware is accessible as a cloud service anyway. Okay? So there's very little point in Google saying, you know, oh, here's, here, have some cloud TPUs, do interesting things with them. Because anyone who wants to actually run inference on version one of the cloud TPU can do it by renting the virtual machines from Google and using it. Right? There's very little value in doing that. And there's also a perceived value in keeping some of the hardware 
smarts in this proprietary, right? You can program this with TensorFlow, but you don't need to know anything more about that because that's valuable intellectual property for the company, or at least the legal department probably thinks so. But also there's a more concerning reasons why Google would not want to do this, right? They don't want to have to support an ASIC. That ASIC's probably built on a fairly aggressive process, um, or at least it's pushing the envelope. It may not be thoroughly tested. It works well enough for Google, and that's what they want, and that's good enough. They don't want to actually have to pay for support. They don't want to have to actually um, deal with other people getting strange results out of these uh, pieces of hardware that Google themselves can prevent happening because they actually control the entire execution platform. So it's really, it's a huge extra effort for Google to let anybody else use a cloud GPU. It really isn't economic. So it's unlikely, even at universities, that you're going to be able to get one of these things. And it's not, I'm not complaining, right? I can see why this happens. Okay. Somehow, though, occasionally, universities, some universities, we're fortunate enough to be one of them, can get hold of some pieces of hardware. So, for example, this is version one of the Microsoft Catapult board, okay, which is a very you know, interesting idea of being able to put an FPGA on the data path between a server and the network and use it for, you know, everything that sits on a PCI bus and, and whatever. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. This has evolved, gone through several more, you know, revisions. It's deployed widely inside um, being in Azure. The challenge of getting one of these things is figuring out how it works once it's arrived. So actually, Microsoft very, very kindly uh, donated a bunch of version one of this because we we're doing a lot of work with FPGAs, accelerating big data workloads and, and machine learning on FPGAs. So a box of these arrived at my colleague's office one day um, with a you know, very nice uh, note from, from Microsoft saying, you know, here they are, and no documentation. <laughs> um, we eventually did get some documentation in the case of, the, uh, of these boards, but other pieces of hardware do arrive with very little documentation, and that's partly because the companies often don't have this documentation. They built this, the hardware designers are sitting next to the programmers, why would you need documentation? It just takes time, and time to market is critical. The documentation falls by the wayside. Okay? And indeed, in some cases, the lawyers really don't want you to release the documentation. You can lend people the hardware, but don't give them the documentation because the documentation says things and has, written down, has statements written down that could get the company into trouble. Okay. So once you've got the hardware, if you're a researcher at a university, doing something with the hardware is stymied by the documentation. But the big, 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 big problem, right? Like, you know, for example, we got a bunch of catapults. We eventually did get the documentation. They're very cool. We did some work with them. But the big, big, big problem with almost all of this hardware, from an academic perspective, is the big decisions have been made. It's been designed for a particular kind of workload, particularly use in mind. Okay? It is cost optimized, right? It is designed to be deployed commercially. It's designed to provide the best return on investment possible at in volume. And so there's a lot of cost-saving specializations, both in the hardware and in the drivers. Its range of, of you know, testing, but also design, is quite narrow. Okay? And so you're going to spend a lot of time finding bugs in the hardware that are not bugs from the company's perspective, because you're trying to do something with the hardware that was never intended by the company in the first place. Or you're doing research on rails. You're doing research into what the hardware designer thought you should be doing with the hardware anyway. In that case, the people who are using this hardware commercially are way ahead of you. And so your research value may be problematic. Even fairly general pieces, purpose piece of hardware. This is a, an Intel part. You can buy this. This is a single package with a Skylake, modified Skylake um, processor on it and an FPGA very closely coupled to it. And you'll see this is quite close to what it is that, that, that we're interested in building. This is Intel's view of what you should be using to experiment with FPGAs. And this is great. It's a very cool thing, except for us, this FPGA here is a long way from the rest of the system. Intel's model is the FPGA is something that helps the processor do what the processor was doing anyway. And so you're, 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 sort of, you're restricting the model again quite a lot by what Intel's view is of what you can do. This is a very cool part. You can buy this. It's a product. Um, we had some, uh, Intel very kindly gave us some early access to this hardware. But it remains, you know, limited, right? There's certain things that we might want to do that are very hard to do on this kind of system. So we've talked about this a lot because we've had access to a lot of custom hardware um, at ETH. 
and we've, we've dealt with, we've worked through a lot of these problems. And so we, we found ourselves thinking this way. What if we actually got hold of a hardware platform that was not optimized for running a commercial workload? It was actually optimized for exploration. It was optimized for research. What would it mean to build a computer for research? People used to do this back in the 70s. They have not done it recently. Right? It's optimized for exploring the design space of hardware and the, and the implications of that design space for software. Okay? So it's not designed to maximize performance per watt or unit cost. It can be more expensive, right? Um, but it should be over-engineered, right? It should be as flexible as possible, much more than you could ever commercially justify if you were selling this to people um, you know, in business. Maybe these days, you, know, you, want, you don't just want just one of these as well. You want it as a building block for building bigger things. Right? So what if we had a research platform that actually allowed us to massively explore the, the hardware design space and build our own very complex machines that were really not constrained by the custom hardware people are already building for their own particular commercial needs? Could we do this? Right? And of course, you know, we said, well, you know, we're at university. We can't build computers. You know? Even ETH, which has a long tradition of building computers. Right? Niklas Wirt built a whole series of computers at ETH um, with interesting kind of features. But it's, universities have typically not done this at scale. Right? They've done it in the electrical engineering department, but they haven't built the kind of computers you'd actually want to use to do real computer science. Whenever you think about doing it, you, know, you think, well, you know, we're limited to some extent by our imagination. Here is what our imagination came up with when we were discussing this mythical computer that would actually help us with our research. It's not, doesn't do everything. It has its limitations, has its compromises. But it was based on the kind of research we were doing and the obstacles we were hitting, right? Where we got into trouble. All we'd like is a server, a proper realistic server. Decent memory, decent network bandwidth, decent um, peripherals, you know, proper cores, right? Proper processor, kind of processor that you might actually have in a data center. And what we want is very close to that, ideally connected by some very low level protocol, right? The biggest FPGA we can find. The biggest FPGA we can find. And the biggest and the fastest FPGA we can find. Okay? And this FPGA should have a lot of memory itself and a lot of network bandwidth. In fact, all the network bandwidth you can stick on this FPGA. Plus, you know, some peripherals and things if we wanted. Okay? This is a realistic today's computing platform. This allows us to explore the hardware design space. Having the two together gives us a very powerful platform for exploring things. This is what we thought we wanted based on our research. You know, my colleague Gustavo and Alonso and I have been doing a lot of work in FPGAs, operating systems, databases, these kinds of things. Wouldn't it be great if we had one of these things? We asked various people if they would build it for us, various companies if they'd build it for us, and people said, well, you know, this is, this is really expensive. And there's really no market for this. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we could actually build it ourselves. And one of the things that has driven this diversity of hardware is also actually made it quite easy to build hardware. It's not easy, but it's easier than it was. Um, in this sort of post-PC era, we're actually entering a phase where it's becoming reasonable to think about building quite complicated pieces of hardware, even on a university's kind of budget. Admittedly, we have a quite a nice budget, but it's still an academic budget. We did not want to rely on standards. Okay? So one of the things you'll notice in this, uh, this diagram here is that I talked about this sort of cache coherent interface here. There are some standards out for this. In our opinion, they're all problematic. We don't like any of them from a research perspective. They might make sense commercially in the short term, but in particular, we did not want PCI Express. If, you want, if you're prepared to accept PCI Express as the way of connecting these two parts of the system, you're in good shape. You can go out and buy cards from Xilinx or from Altera or something that will do this sort of stuff. We did not want that. And um, there's plenty of reasons why. We had, you know, PCI Express is good for what it did. It gets in the way for a lot of the work that we're doing. All right? So what can we build one of these? Could we actually, actually build a computer that did this job? Surprisingly, we actually thought we could. Um, we could use it for two things. Right? The design I've shown you is, is good for emulating possible new platform designs. Right? We can use that FPGA to make it look like all kinds of things. In particular, we could use it to make it look like a catapult or look like um, an Amazon F1 instance. So 
or, you know, or look like you know, other things that are done with FPGAs. And we can even do little toy versions of TPUs and things on there. Not as fast as an ASIC, but nevertheless, we can try things out. But actually, perhaps this is actually quite a good platform anyway. It's general purpose. Right? That FPGA gives you huge flexibility. So that's an interesting question there. Okay? And we managed to get hold of some hardware. We cobbled together some hardware that uh, a particular company called Cavium gave us. This is an evaluation board for their version one of their 48-core, 64-bit ARM processor. Okay? What's cool about this board is that this processor is a dual socket part. Right? So it has external cache coherence. But this board has only one socket. And it has three connectors right, that actually carry the cache coherency traffic onto another board. So you, basically, they gave this out to OEMs. And if you want to prototype a dual socket system, you just plug two of these boards together, turn it on, and it boots up in a two-socket system. We didn't do that. What we did was to plug these connectors here into an FPJ board, which we also got from Xilinx, with the biggest FPGA we could find, which is the XCVU 9P at the time. This is the one that's used in Amazon F1. And by plugging these things together, we could actually try and implement something that caused us to talk to the Cavium cache currency protocol. And Cavium were very, very helpful uh, at telling us how this stuff worked and giving us access to a lot of information. Okay? And so we actually built it. It looks, it looks like this. This is uh, my postdoc's office. Here's the Cavium board. Here are these three eye-wateringly expensive cables that carry cache coherence onto this board, which we built ourselves, which is really just an adapter board that plugs into Xilinx's evaluation board um, over here. Okay? And this machine is the initial version of something we call Enzian. It boots, it runs Linux, but also runs Barrelfish, the last operating system we built in the group. Um, and there are actually two of these. You can see the other one in the background there, but this uh, next picture, if we can get this to work. Ooh. Oh, no, wrong one. There we go. This next picture shows we actually have two of these systems together. And this is what we've been basically working on for the last year. And so it's building these things together. Now, this is a big, clunky machine. I said we didn't need to be cost-optimized or power or anything. But I want, you know, if I'm going to have a research platform like this, you know, I, 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 two of these is fine, but I want 100 of these in a rack, and we're not going to be able to deal with 100 of these. What we actually want is to shrink all of this stuff down to a single board and actually put a lot more stuff on it. Okay? And that's actually what we're doing right now, actually in the process of doing that um, right now. And this is the design of the board that we actually want. And we should get prototypes of this back in about five weeks from manufacture whereupon we have to get all the software working. We have a very short amount of space of time to get the software working. But this is, this is the board that we think represents the right compromise between what we can build, what we really want to explore that huge hardware design space. We've got 400 gigabits of network bandwidth over here. 16, 25 gig serial lines. You can configure these as Ethernet, um, whatever. We've got half a terabyte of memory here. It's not going to be enough, but it's good. Right? Half a terabyte of DRAM on the FPGA is fine. 128 gigabytes is pretty much all the, the, the memory this Thunder X will take. So fully, fully stuffing this. 40, two 40 gig Ethernet interfaces is fully utilizing all the Ethernet hardware on here. Basically, everything is maxed out. This is the biggest thing we can fit on one board, deliberately so. Maximum reconfigurability, maximum flexibility. We don't care about unit cost. Turns out unit cost isn't so bad. It's totally dominated by DRAM. So everything else is kind of lost in the noise apart from this. And Xilinx have been very, very helpful and generous with this, uh, with these chips. But then you've got, you know, PCI Express. You can plug your GPU in here if you really want to. NVMe, NVMe, PCI Express, all the usual stuff. But the really key thing is this very close coupling here, right? We can send data onto custom hardware in here back to the processor extremely fast at an extremely low level without having to go through any of these sort of buses or anything like that. As I said, this surprise, to my surprise, because I'm not a hardware person, first time I've done this, we are actually very close to having one of these things actually built, or having 15 of these things actually built, uh, which is the first production run. Um, uh, this is actually what it's going to look like. This is what was sent, sent back by the design house who we contracted to build this. Uh, this is pretty cool. This is a render of what the board's going to look like. Um, for me, as a sort of you know, software person, it's really cool to be able to play with these things. This, this thing here is the... Um, the FPGA, this is the Cavium processor, got all the usual connectors here, USB, SATA, and stuff. Uh, said, designed for flexibility and also designed for reliability rather than price. 
So we cut corners. So, for example, these connectors here are actually flyover connectors for very high-speed signals. It makes the board easier to design, makes it easier, more likely to work the next, first time, less worry about signal integrity, all this kind of stuff. Here's all the, um, all the network interfaces are on the back here. Two different PCI slots, one for each side. Most of what I showed you on the previous diagram, you can sort of recognize on this board. Um, I thought this was really cool. I've never, ever built hardware before. And to my surprise, at a university, I could actually get this stuff done. Um, hopefully, it'll work. Um, it arrives pretty soon. Now, we obviously don't want to hang on to this just for ourselves. We'll keep the first 15, assuming they actually work. Um, but the goal here really is that this, is, this is, is really how we change how the systems community, the operating systems community, the database community, and the systems for machine learning community can actually work. How, we've talked to lots of people who think that this would be very useful to them, maybe useful to you. Our goal is to build a lot of this, these things um, and seed them out to other universities. This is a, an attempt to shift the research agenda into something that is more exciting, but also more relevant um, in the longer term and to get operating systems research and other kinds of systems research out of this sort of box that it's got a little bit tied into. So there's precedents for this. You know, NetFPGA, you may be familiar with. Planet Lab, a system I built a while ago at Intel. DPDK, even BSD are ideas of the research community building artifacts that help them then do their research. This is kind of one of those things. And so that's really what I wanted to sort of talk about. Hopefully, in the next few months, we'll have the first ones back and then you know, we'll start talking to other people who have already expressed an interest in having them um, and start building a community around this kind of platform rather than commodity PCs as a way of doing research. Uh, lots of people have been involved in this. It's quite a big team. And we've also had tons of help from Cavium and Xilinx. Uh, they've been really, really nice to us. Um, these are the current people on the team. Uh, it's probably going to change next week as well. We'll get some more people on board. Um, and um, with that, I'm done. So the summary here is that common off-the-shelf ha hardware, even GPUs to some extent these days, are not necessarily realistic for this kind of work in the future. If you really want to be out there in the future, you need to get ahead of people building custom hardware. And this, I think, is our best bet for getting ahead of the custom hardware people. Because the custom hardware people will already have made a load of decisions that will restrict the kind of exploration that we can do. And so hopefully. In a few years' time, a significant chunk of the people will actually have access to platforms like this or something like it, uh, and we can actually explore this design space. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty exciting way of, of the rethinking system software in the light of this kind of reconfigurable hardware. So that, I am done. Um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. All the best wishes for, for your team that this board should come see the light of the day very soon. Uh, just one question. Do you want to, do you have any plan to commercialize it or you'll be donating it? Uh, neither. Uh, we can't donate it. We're not a charity. Uh, no, we're not interested necessarily in making a huge amount of money out of it. Uh, that may just be me. I have a slight of a, I, I, as uh, Chandu said, I've, I, I've worked for startups um, and I, I survived. Uh, our our goal at the moment is to make this available to the research community essentially at cost. Okay, so uh, our, our sort of template is NetFPGA, right, which was done about five, six years ago. It's a PCI NIC, essentially, with NetFPGA on it. And what they did was they set up a non-profit company that essentially got arranged for the manufacturer distribution of these things at cost. Uh, we've been talking to Xilinx. The big unknown about the cost of it is the cost of that huge FPGA. Um, and Xilinx are very interested in providing that to whoever we get to build these in volume at academic pricing, or say two, two kinds of pricing, one for academics, one for companies that might want to use it. We have had interest from companies in actually acquiring a few of these things. Actually, even Microsoft. There's a guy in Microsoft Research who wants to. Uh, yeah, so the, yes. In the, in the initial part of your presentation, told that the first first challenge is uh, the boards are not available. So yeah. you know, I'm glad that you, your team is taking care of that challenge. Mm -hmm. Second challenge, you told that uh, the yeah. documentation for the board is also not available. Yes. So I, I hope somebody in your team is taking care of that as well. Documentation for this board. Our our hope is to actually well, first of all, provide a lot of documentation, a lot of useful example software and everything, um, but also to make as much of the design open as possible. Um, there are bits of that design that we're in negotiation with companies to actually talk about. Um, 
even if we even if we can't talk about some bits of it, we think we can wrap those up into the FPGA shell, um, and then still without impeding the flexibility of the rest of the platform. So the goal is to make this absolutely as open as possible. You know, yes, this is an academic thing. Open source is good. More information allows people to do more stuff. So absolutely, that's our, that's our goal, definitely. Yeah. So I think uh, this is Victor here. All oh, right. Okay. Hi, Victor. Oh, sorry. There you go. Yeah, I got the light yeah. to me. Hi, Victor. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is great. I, I actually do. I think uh, you're right. Uh, we're in academia, also. I mean, gone so many of these sort of things in the past. But um, I have a bunch of questions I'll reserve them for later with you. But I want to ask you here in public: um, <laughs> What's what are you burning to do with this board right now? What are we burning? Yeah, so l let me explain <laughs> what I mean by that. So many of these, so you know, I, have, I also have some experience doing things like this in the past, and and so there is a sort of a difference between what gets adopted and what the industry runs with versus what papers get written by mm -hmm. in terms of the research. So is there something that is that sort of bothers you that you really want to get your hands on and you can't actually do this without this board that you really want to go after? Well, so, are, are the things that we about? can't do what, what, what kind of problem do you want to go after right now? Right, so, um, I, so I have about, um, you know, in backup here, I have about 15 different slides, each of which has a different research project we want to try out on this. Uh, I didn't run, didn't run through them partly because of time, partly because many of them are not to do with machine learning. Um, but we have a whole list of different applications we'd like to use this for, and, and, and use it in various different ways. You can view the FPGA as... A gatekeeper, you can view it as a, as a smart NIC, as a monitoring system, as an accelerator, as a memory controller, as all kinds of different things. We have lots of ideas there. Um, it is a compromise, you know, but, it, but it's given us, it gives us way more flexibility than we can get with any other platform we could buy from that perspective. Um, and so before we started, we had a whole load of ideas for doing this. But there's another benefit to actually going through this process, which is one of the reasons that, that, that I'm still smiling um, after all this stuff, which is that we'd never built a computer before. We'd never known, you know, it, 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 this is a, you know, it's an 18 layer EATX port. This is a big deal. Um, it's been really an interesting experience learning about this. I've had a superb postdoc who's really into formal methods, uh, OS design and hardware. And he's been doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the hardware side of this stuff. So we've learned a huge amount about how modern computers work, which you don't tend to learn. We don't teach in a, computer, in a, in a university curriculum, and we've got not, not got a bad teaching curriculum. Um, that itself has generated a whole lot of other ideas. So it's been a very generative project. Even if it never works, <laughs> we, um, you know, we have come up with so many interesting questions because of the different perspective we have gained on computer hardware as a result of doing it. Um, so that's an additional benefit. I mean, these are hard to quantify, but fortunately at a university, there's less pressure on to quantify these things. Um, so it's, it, I, I would say it's been, it's been worth all the effort so far. Um, uh, will it have been all the way the effort so far if we never get it working? Maybe not, but yeah, it's close. It's been a journey. <laughs> For you, I think this is great. Thanks. Over there. Any thoughts on uh, the software interfaces uh, for such a you know, reprogrammable system that fits as your um, uh, Many, uh, many thoughts. Um, we don't think one size fits all because there are so many different research use cases. I mean, it's a question of whether you, you know, in the, the system that you're evaluating, whether you um, make the FPGA visible or you try to forget about the FPJ because it's emulating a different piece of hardware and stuff. So all of those will really change how the software works. Um, in, to, in the specific case where the FPJ is part of the application, right, it's actually doing functioning like an accelerator or a smart NIC, um, the right way to do that software interface is, a, is a, one of the several of the research projects we want to do. Um, at different levels, right? So there's how do I interact with an accelerator? What is the kind of accelerator design we want? If you talk to operating systems people about the, in, the software interface to hardware, you know, they can happily rant for ages about how broken this is and how hardware designers don't understand what it, think, it means to program these things. But if you ask us, 
what it should look like, we go kind of quiet because we tend to lack the language to talk about the right so hardware software interface ourselves. One of our, my goals in doing this is to get a better understanding of that so I can actually say what the right hardware software interface is from an operating systems perspective and try to encode some of those rules. <laughs> Ultimately, because I've also found myself drifting into formal methods recently, what I'd like is to be able to write a specification of the software in an interface to a piece of hardware that is emulated on the FPGA in, a spec in, in, in some formal language and have it generate both the driver and the Verilog for the hardware at the same time. And then I can build into that compiler a lot of the tacit knowledge that operating systems people have about the right way to talk to hardware. You know, enough asynchrony, self-virtualization, protection, you know, access control, all that sort of stuff we can actually put into the compiler uh, as a way of encoding what we've, what, what we've learned to talk about in the process of doing this. Um, but then, no, these are, these are really open questions. Uh, and, and I think they're important ones. Right? The, the, the current state of the art is very ad hoc. Uh, and I think we can do a lot better as scientists. Thank you, Moti.